was one of the luckiest kids in the world. I grew up on the grounds of Shaw Nature Reserve, just outside of St. Louis, because my parents lived and worked on the property. I had a childhood filled with exploring creeks, hiking in the woods, and getting impressive numbers of tick bites. As a teenager, I had seasonal jobs there, and for at least one summer, I helped my dad, who was establishing 200 acres of a tall grass prairie planting. It's a wonderful planting that has introduced lots of people around St. Louis to what a real prairie might look like. I think everyone can grasp the concept that you can't go out and plant a desert or an arctic tundra, but for some reason, there's this romantic notion that you can go out into a field, throw out a bunch of wildflower seeds, and bingo, instant prairie. People do it, and my dad was one of them but he would never claim that he was creating a prairie ecosystem. He understood, as do all prairie habitat restoration specialists, that you can construct or reconstruct some elements of prairie, and some prairie insects and birds and other creatures will take up residence there on their own. But prairie in Missouri is thousands of years old. You can't do an instant prairie makeover and expect all the parts to be intact. I have fond memories of helping my dad. When I would close my eyes at night after working with him all day, the image of prairie drop seed grass would be etched on my eyelids like a negative. I was fortunate to go on to work in the field of conservation and specifically into my current career of prairie conservation. And my job entails explaining what prairie is and what it isn't. I think the concept of prairie can be difficult for some people to understand or appreciate, and I can see why. Because we don't think about prairie as being part of our everyday lives. It's not part of our pop culture. I'm not aware of any animated Pixar prairie film. But mostly, I think it's because at first glance, prairie doesn't always appear impressive. It looks simple. After all, it's a landscape of grasses and wildflowers, with few trees. From a distance, it doesn't look like there's much going on. It looks like a lot of emptiness, like an ocean. But think of all the life in an ocean. It's the same with prairie. You have to stop and look closely, and then you'll see immense detail and diversity. All of these life forms are right here in Missouri, not in some faraway place. Several years ago, this point was brought home to me when I was visiting the Berkeley Botanical Garden, which cultivates and displays plants from the world's temperate climates. When I was there, I admired the monkey puzzle trees from the Andes, proteas from South Africa, and I gushed over dozens of other plants from faraway places. And then I came to the Eastern North American plant collection, and there, Blooming just a few feet away from those other marvelous plants, I saw western ironweed collected from my current home of Cole County, Missouri. Asters, coneflowers, prairie drop seed grass, and other plants from Missouri's prairies were on display, getting equal stage time with exotic flora of the world. But of course, all of those prairie plants that I saw are themselves part of the world's exotica. It's good to want to see bizarre and beautiful plants and wildlife in distant places, but we have amazing species right here on our own prairies in Missouri. Plants like sensitive briar, whose leaflets will fold at the touch of a fingertip, and compass plant, whose basal leaves can somehow align themselves north-south, and whose roots can extend 15 feet below ground, and grasses whose Seeds are like drills that can rotate after a rain to reach the soil's surface. And we have pink katydids, as incredible as a monkey puzzle tree. Prairie in Missouri is amazing and beautiful, so how come more people don't know about it? Well, unfortunately, because it's very scarce. In fact, we have less than 1% remaining of its original acreage. With such a small amount remaining, there isn't as much of it around for people to see as there once was. And when it goes, its loss is not always immediately noticed. 
Unlike giant trees crashing down through a rainforest canopy, prairie doesn't make much noise when it goes. And when it's plowed up and replaced with something else green, the land can look, when you're driving by at 60 miles an hour, vaguely the same as what was there before, like corn and soybean fields, or like this. This is grass, but it isn't prairie. It's tall fescue, a Eurasian grass that was introduced here in the 1950s for cattle forage and for other purposes. And today, it covers an estimated 14 million acres of Missouri. That's almost a third of the state. It's virtually useless to wildlife. It chokes out native vegetation. It contains toxins that can poison the cattle that eat it. But don't get me started about tall fescue. <laughs> so much of our original landscape has been altered. So much, in fact, that it can be difficult to understand why saving our few remaining and often very small tracts of original prairie would make any difference and what we would lose if they were gone. At the time of statehood, there were 15 million acres of prairie in Missouri, about a third of the state. Prairie here evolved about 8,000 years ago, along with our forests and other native habitats. And it was part of the great North American prairie ecosystem that stretched from Ohio and other parts eastward, west to the Rockies, north into Canada, and south to Mexico. 40% of what became the city of St. Louis, even Tower Grove Park with its statuesque trees, was once covered in prairie grasses and wildflowers. Today, we have fewer than 90,000 scattered prairie acres remaining. Prairie in Missouri is the rarest habitat type in the state, even more rare than wetlands. And globally, it's more rare than tropical rainforests. This is what we had, and this is what we have left. I showed this map to someone recently, but I wasn't prepared for her response. When she looked at the map of remaining prairie, she said, but there's nothing there. This is like a joke. After I pulled the knife out of my heart, I thought about why she would say that. And trying to look at it through her eyes, I admit what's left looks like specks on the map. But this is one of those specks, and this is another, and another, and another, and two more. And all of those specks on the map add up to more prairie than anyone in this room has likely ever seen. Suppose, and heaven forbid, the St. Louis Art Museum burned down, and only 1% of its collections remained. We would not think that that 1% was like a joke. We would treasure what was left. We would do everything we could to protect it. And like works of art, our remaining prairies can never be recreated. Our prairie remnants that we have today are mostly in southwestern Missouri, where rocky ground has spared some parcels from the plow. These are patches of a few thousand, a few hundred, or even a few dozen acres. And unless we act swiftly, there's no guarantee that we won't lose many of these. These remnants have inherent value. They don't have to prove their worth, but they do serve us well, especially if we consider the monetary value of the services that they provide to us, of carbon storage, pollination, water filtration, and other measurable benefits. They're also storehouses of seeds, which people like my dad are using all across the state to replace tall fescue and other non-native landscapes with diverse prairie plantings. They're taking fescue monocultures like this and turning them into diverse prairie plantings like this. These aren't true prairie with every part intact, but they are critically important for wildlife, for pollinators, for water quality, and for other reasons. I want to show you some of the ways that original prairie and planted prairie help us. It's possible for as many as seven inches of rain from one storm to be absorbed by prairie with no runoff. With its complex and deep roots, prairie is like an incredible sponge that helps prevent erosion and prevent flooding. Also, one acre of prairie can absorb a ton of carbon in its roots and soil per year, 
we obviously need any self-sustaining process that can help neutralize our CO2 emissions for us. And prairie plants are adapted to drought. Cattle producers have found that when their livestock eat prairie forage as opposed to non-native grasses, their livestock gain weight faster and are healthier. And non-native grasses can dry up in the summer. So having prairie is like having drought insurance. Nationally, the value of pollinating, pollination services by native bees has been calculated at $3 billion a year. Prairies in Missouri are host to a wide diversity and abundance of native pollinating insects, including 200 species of native bees. Prairies are critical at sustaining bee populations, and by extension, they're important for our food security. I know I may sound like one of those annoying parents who go on and on about her child's straight-A report card, but I've got more. <laughs> there are yet other uses of prairie, and these new applications would not be possible without our original prairies, their seeds, and their soil. For example, Researchers in Iowa have demonstrated that by planting strips of prairie plants within row crops, they can dramatically reduce the amount of uh, fertilizer runoff and soil erosion. This kind of land use technology used at a large scale could help reduce or lessen the serious problem of excess nutrients and sediments that are flowing off the land and runoff into the Mississippi River. This pollution has created a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's killing economically important fish, shrimp, and other sea life. Prairie can help stop this problem. In northeastern Missouri, there's a project underway to convert thousands of acres of degraded farmland into diverse prairie plantings. The biomass from these plantings will be converted to compressed natural gas. And while the above ground plant parts are harvested, meanwhile, below ground, the roots will continue to curb soil erosion, prevent it, and also store carbon. At the University of Missouri, soil scientists are gathering new information about prairie soil microbes. Using genomics, they're finding that some of these microbes have the potential to actually reduce the amount of synthetic chemicals used in agriculture. And there's still so much more to be learned from our prairies. There are new data being collected from our remnants every year, despite the fact that ecologists have determined that prairie is one of the least conserved, most threatened terrestrial ecosystems on Earth. This past summer, the botanist Justin Thomas was surveying an eight, excuse me, a 160-acre tract of original prairie in Dade County, Missouri. He found a record number of 35 native plant species growing in a quarter meter square. Many of these plants will grow nowhere else in the world but on high quality original prairie. For comparison, the average number of native plant species that you can find in a quarter meter of Missouri forest is seven. In an area of original prairie, the size of the seat of the chair you're sitting in, Thomas found 35 native plant species. In that, it, and that's the most he's ever found at that scale anywhere else in Missouri. In that quarter meter was this milkwort, this June grass, this prairie phlox, and 32 other different prairie plant species. This kind of biological diversity is simply not possible to replicate in a planting. Even in a prairie reconstruction started in the 1940s in Madison, Wisconsin, biologists there are still not seeing the species richness of plants or animals that are found in an original prairie. Also this past summer, the bee biologist Mike Arduzer, who's from here in St. Louis, was surveying an eight-acre patch of original prairie in Joplin. He found a native bee species that most bee experts have never even seen. And the male of the species has yet to be described by science. As Arduzer said, while a few acres of habitat may be just a corner park to us, for some bees and other insects, it's their entire world. There's also new information to be learned from our prairie soils. For example, 
Two years ago, researchers from the University of Colorado published some amazing news. They had found abundant bacteria in the soil of unplowed prairies from an entire phylum of bacteria that is not present in the soil of tilled fields that were once prairie. In 2013, the New York Times editorial board wrote, finding these bacteria is like finding a piece of a lost continent. I've shared some compelling reasons why we must save our remaining original prairie. With all of its virtues, though, why does saving what's left have to be so difficult? It's true that fluctuating demand for corn and other commodities is a driver in increased land prices, and that can make it financially difficult for conservation buyers to save prairie. But on a societal level, the cost of saving prairie compared with its ecological worth and its, and its uh, economic benefits to us is still very small. Our remaining prairies are vestiges of one of the mightiest ecosystems ever to have graced the earth. Prairie soils turned North America into an agricultural powerhouse like nowhere else in the world. But what remain are not artifacts. They are teeming with life. They are living laboratories of genetic resources that we cannot afford to lose. Our remaining prairies also help define us. They help make us different. They give us the confidence to defy the concept of flyover country. As the quintessentially American poet Walt Whitman wrote in 1879, while I know the standard claim is that Yosemite, Niagara Falls, the Upper Yellowstone, and the like afford the greatest natural shows, I am not so sure but the prairies and plains, while less stunning at first sight, last longer, fill the aesthetic sense fuller, precede all the rest, and make North America's characteristic landscape. You can enjoy some of the qualities of prairie that Whitman loved by including some prairie plants in your landscaping. You'll enjoy their beauty, and I bet you'll have fun observing what visits them. But remember, it's our remaining original prairie that provide us with the plants and soil to help improve our quality of life in many ways. I encourage you to visit them, to feel their full effect. If they go, we can't get them back. They can never be recreated. Our remaining true prairie is relevant, and it matters today more than ever. Thank you.